I'm really very pleased to be here today um, and to see all the interest in this uh, in, in this wonderful series that you've set up. Um, <clears throat> so um, I want to just give a brief overview and and I guess the first point is a trigger warning because I will be following an historical trajectory in explaining how we got to where we are, which began, um, as was mentioned, in my experience in uh, at Stanford way back in the last millennium. So those of you who don't like history can check out now. Uh, so we go through the development of measuring sleepiness and the start of the adolescent sleep story at the Stanford sleep camp. Uh, then I'll continue into puberty and its association with daytime sleepiness, morningness, eveningness, a little bit about circadian physiology and adolescent sleep-wake homeostasis, and then uh, an overview of perfect storm models. So <clears throat> let's start the history lesson. So I was in the laboratory of Dr. William C. DeMent, a uh, late lamented um, mentor and just an amazing figure in our field. And he really was the individual who spurred us to really start thinking about and making progress in measuring sleepiness. At the time, this was 1970, uh, the sleep clinic had just been established and was focused more than anything else on insomnia and sleeping pills. But Dr. DeMant also had an interest in narcolepsy and in really figuring out what a patient means when they say they're sleepy. So that led to the development of the Stanford Sleepiness Scale. Eric Hodges was a graduate student at Stanford at the time, and he did all the heavy lifting uh, in developing this measure. And as you see on the screen, it's a seven point scale, and it was developed using you know, techniques of psychology in building a questionnaire. And it's, um, it was built on the principles of equally appearing intervals. So, each of these points is an equivalent distance from the other. So this was, you know, one of the most early developments and Dr. Hodges did um, reliability and validity testing of this measure. Excuse me. There we go. So, but it wasn't, as successful as we had hoped. Uh, and although it was administered to our sleepy patients, there were concerns that evolved over time. First was at, at Stanford, there were a lot of individual patients who were for whom English was a second language. And so the idiomatic terms on the SSS were a challenge for some of them. Uh, and although the scale since was translated into other languages, at the time it was really a, an English language form. And it's hard to translate the methodology that developed it um, just by translating the words that make up the, the uh, items. So it's an interesting conundrum. Um, I don't know, to me it's of historical interest. Then it became eh, evident that it was important to capture REM sleep in measuring sleepiness, particularly in narcolepsy, and that although Biedrich Roth in uh, Czechoslovakia had a methodology for evaluating his patients, um, he used a single long, lengthy nap during the day which gave a false negative rate that was pretty high at causing patients to have to return a second day. And the reason REM sleep was so important really stemmed from this uh, event, this symposium that was held in 1975 in France 
that was the first international symposium on narcolepsy. And in the whole group, they came to this consensus definition of narcolepsy, which before this point was a word that meant excessive sleepiness and sleep attacks. So uh, the consensus, as you see, defines narcolepsy as a syndrome of unknown origin that is characterized by abnormal sleep tendencies, including excessive daytime sleepiness, often disturbed nocturnal sleep, and pathological manifestations of REM sleep, including sleep onset REM periods. And, you know, as you all know, the dissociation of REM sleep inhibitory processes. So um, this really led everyone to think, well, we have to find a way to measure these uh, phenomena in the patients as they're coming through to just tell the story or do the work to find out what's going on. And I'm struggling to advance the slides. There we go. So around the same time, Dr. DeMent was interested in looking at sleep on a 90 minute day. He was specifically interested in REM sleep uh, and how and whether it would occur. So we had participants, these were healthy um, young adults in general, who would come into the lab for um, a time, as you can see on the right side here, this was, you know, a lot, a lot of days and nights, especially if you add up all the 90 minute days, of which there were 16 every 24 hours. Um, so we made a, a lot of interesting findings from this that led to us to the MSLT. Um, so what you see here is the sleep latencies on the 90 minute day protocol. So here you have all of the um, 90 minute nights, how long it took to fall asleep. And you can see there is a pattern. Uh, and it led us to think, well, we could measure, we could use this measure of sleep latency in brief naps across the day to give us an objective measure of sleep tendency. And indeed that led to the MSLT. Uh, and this is just the basic protocol for the MSLT as it was first uh, imagined or implemented. So the first test is until the participant's been up for an hour and a half or two hours. And then the tests continue at two hour intervals with a 20 minute opportunity to fall asleep and as you can see, um, there other components were important, including having the participant in a dark room, lying in a comfortable bed with the instructions to please close your eyes, lie quietly and try to fall asleep. So the first guidelines for MSLT weren't published until 1986, but we were working on this protocol starting in 1976. And one of the first things was to decide, well, how do you define sleep onset? Because there's a lot of things that go on uh, when you're monitoring participants as they are in this comfortable uh, sleep, sleep onset or try to fall asleep environment. And so we looked at a number of things. Well, our slow rolling eye movements, the place we want to start, or a mini microsleep, or 15 seconds of microsleep, or a full EPOC scored as microsleep, or wait until you see a spindle or K complex. So there were a lot of individual differences, and we decided to do a the first 30-second um, epoch that was scorable as stage one sleep and not wait for this and not start here because some participants would their eye, have slow rolling eye movements for minutes before actually showing a transition to the EEG stage one. So, I mean, this was how these uh, parameters were set and defined. 
So that's our basic measure for, um, for sleepiness that we then started using at the Stanford Sleep Camp where we were studying adolescent sleep and particularly sleep need and uh, the manifestations of sleepiness in the daytime. So our principal hypothesis was that across adolescent development, we would expect to see no change in daytime sleepiness measured with this MSLT, assuming nocturnal sleep time was held constant. So the opportunity held constant, though at that point, we expected that the sleep duration would fall as the kids aged. This was a longitudinal study, so we really could talk about development uh, in this context rather than as more recently we and others have done cross-sectional uh, assessments at different ages. So this was how we uh, ran the protocol. Uh, so the kids were asked to sleep at home from 10 p.m. <clears throat> to 8 a.m. for a week before coming into the lab for three consecutive nights. And on the days, we would measure sleep latency using the MSLT at two hour intervals. And then the kids would go home. Although some of the subsequent studies we did, for those of you interested in this, the kids would stay a few more days being sleep deprived or sleep restricted or sleep extended. So we played around with this quite a bit. But our basic protocol you see right here and so the question was across the, as the kids came back summer after summer, the amount of sleep they uh, had on each of these overnights would be less than before. Because the common wisdom at that time was as you pass through adolescent development, you need less sleep. So this, one of my principal mentors was Tom Anders. Um, who this is him at sleep camp with his son at the time, his, he now has grandchildren older than this. Um, but the question that has been raised was why did you give them 10 hours each night? And we thought based on some questionnaire data that 10 hours a night would be plenty of sleep for this age range. So the kids when they started were 10, 11 or 12 years old. So, um, and that seemed to be plenty for the younger kids who didn't then have a weekend uh, increase in sleep. So what did we find? Well, my initial uh, analyses showed that the kids on average were sleeping a uh, little bit more than nine hours a night on the third night. So, uh, and this was over all three years. Then we did, we reanalyzed after we had kids in for six years and showed about the same amount of sleep uh, in the kids who were six years older than they were when they started uh, with girls uh, 10 or one sleeping a little less than girls at 10 or three. So I'll talk about Tanner in a minute, but this is a, a rating of pubertal stage. So there was no evidence that as the kids got older, they were sleeping less across the years or across changes in puberty. There was some evidence of a longer sleep latency in the post-pubertal kids when the kids were post-pubertal and some evidence that they were few, less uh, often waking spontaneously at the end of the night. So, um, so our conclusion was that sleep need in this age was about nine hours, uh, which was is a lot. <laughs> it's hard to convince kids in their adolescence that they need that much sleep. But then we subsequently did a study we called the long night study just to see how much kids really would sleep. So this study, we had 15, 12 to 14 year olds. They kept a 10 hour time in bed at home for a little more than a week, then in the lab one night for the same 10 hour time in bed. And then three consecutive 
long nights, 18 hours time in bed. Even with pre-treating with plenty of sleep, we thought on the first night, the average amount of sleep was 739 minutes, which is a ton of sleep. Even on the second night, it was about 11 hours. And by night three, it had come down to 10 hours. So then the question is, well, wait, is 10 hours the amount of sleep needed in adolescence? Well, more recently, work done by Michelle Short and others uh, at the University of South Australia um, did a dose response modeling in, in a little bit older kids, 15 to 17 year old boys and girls, looking at how much sleep would be needed to sustain their attention on a visual attention task. And this study uh, came up with nine hour, 9.35 hours. So again, pretty much sleep seemed to be optimal for adolescents. But do we want to think of optimal when we talk about how much sleep kids need or adequate? And should we include more than simply duration, but also what time they're sleeping? and how fragmented the sleep is. So I think there's still work to be done on this question of sleep need of adolescents. But I think, in my mind at least, the initial uh, forecast, I guess, that as, as kids pass through adolescence, they need less sleep, doesn't seem to be what we're seeing in data analyzed in several different ways. So let's bring puberty into the situation here. So Tanner staging was first proposed by a physician, a pediatrician whose surname is Tanner. And that was back again, in the last millennium. At sleep camp, we had Dr. Iris Litt, uh, who is the chair of adolescent medicine at Stanford. And a couple of her fellows did the ratings for us. In boys, the Tanner stage ratings are based on pubertal hair growth and genital development and girls, pubertal hair growth and breast development. So I've already mentioned Tanner stage a little bit, but Tanner stage one is prepubertal, childlike, and there are three other stages before you get to Tanner stage five, which is postpubertal, adult-like. So here are, the, this is uh, taken from my dissertation. Uh, with the help of one of my mentors, who was uh, Helena Kramer, we were looking at the MSLT results using this kind of structure, which basically is saying how many of the participants survived to stay awake during the MSLT. And so you can see uh, and here you see the data arranged by time of day, 9.30, 11.30, and so forth. And so you can see that there is a difference in the pre and early pubertal kids versus the uh, mid and post pubertal kids. They're not kids, sorry, I should be saying when they were at those Tanner stages because this was a longitudinal study. And where you see the biggest division here is in the middle of the afternoon, uh, 1330 and 1530, where more than half of the kids had fallen asleep within the 20 minute limit. And then you can see in the later in the afternoon and evening, there is no real difference between the Tanner groups. So this is just redrawing the overall picture with time of day now here uh, on the horizontal axis showing the average means and uh, standard errors across the day. So the kids when they were Tanner stages one and two basically were, were alert all day long and rarely fell asleep within the 20 minute interval. And if they did, it was you know over 15. And here was what really caught our eye 
was this dip in the middle of the day in our mid to post pubertal kids. So that, uh, I, that struck us as something notable and we kind of waved our hands and, and decided, oh, well, when you pass into puberty, you need a nap in the middle of the day. Well, subsequently, we figured out that wasn't really what was going on. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a turn here to get to um, a first look at the circadian system. So puberty and morning this evening, this we had the opportunity to, this was a little later, uh, as you can see, 91, to pair up with a magazine that was sent to kids in grades four through six. And um, they, they wanted a story about sleep in this age range. And so we helped them write this story. And they said, we, we want the students to be able to do something in the magazine. So they helped us um, do write a morning, this evening, this survey targeting this age range of early adolescence. And we asked them, uh, could we please have a measure of puberty in the magazine too? And they said, no, uh, we're not touching puberty in our magazine. So we derived a big project where we asked in the magazine, we asked teachers, would you please sign on to send materials to the, to give materials to the children, send them to their parents and for you yourself to do a brief survey on each of the kids. That, that ended up being a pretty big deal, but we had a number of teachers around the country who did sign on. So before we get there, Here's some samples of the um, items that are on our super science morning, this evening, this scale for, again, these are kids, maybe 10 to 13 or 14 years of age. So this is just an example of turning around our usual morning, this evening, this scales into a scale that would be meaningful to kids of this age. Um, so anyway, there are 10 items and you know, here's the citation if you're interested in seeing the full scale. So here's the puberty rating scale. So we figured we couldn't use the scale that was around at the time that had either photographs or drawings of kids at these different Tanner stages. So we borrowed a, a um, scale that and modified a little bit of scale that had been divided that was based on words. And so these are the items that are on that scale and you get a score that then reflects the kid's pubertal status. Now, just to, so you know, uh, we more recently, with the help of Elise uh, Berhoff, worked, uh, did a test retest of this puberty rating scale against our ratings in lab of the kids doing themselves, of the parents uh, evaluating them, and also not shown here uh, with Tanner staging done by a medical professional. So it turns out this is a pretty good scale. Although when you actually look at the numbers, it's probably better to divide it into two points rather than five points. So it sort of falls apart a little bit when you try to go to individual puberty stages. So back to the survey, this, this, each dot on this map of the United States uh, is five surveys. Sorry for the quality or the lack of quality of this, but somehow I didn't save a digital version. So this is hanging on the wall here in the lab. Uh, so went to a lot of places, uh, 93 teachers distributed the forms uh, and you know all of these things ended up with us looking at sixth graders. We thought that would be a time where kids are, some kids are still prepubertal, some are into puberty and maybe uh, already mature. So you can see the sample description here. And here's what we found with our um, kid 
focus morning this evening this score and the puberty categories in sixth grade girls so you can see there was an association in the girls the girls were further along or rated themselves further along in puberty than boys and that's certainly predictable but in both cases we see more allish tendencies as the kids are more mature so that's a, a finding you know around this time uh, there were folks in Brazil who were making similar conclusions from work in Brazilian children. So this wasn't just a unique uh, finding. Okay, um, so we still have this issue. What is going on? Is it just that older kids, even though they're getting the same amount of sleep as they did when they were younger, need a nap in the middle of the day? Well, Here's where having that morning, this evening, this data gave us a really important head start on trying to explain this um, using the two process model. So we had done a forced desynchrony study. Um, and this is the protocol for that. So you can see the kids were on a fixed schedule for a little bit over a week. Uh, they did a constant routine and then entered into a 28-hour forced desynchrony uh, protocol. These were kids. The youngest was nine years old, and the oldest, I think, was 16 or 17 years old. This study, as you can see, I mean, they're in our lab the, the entire time from this X to this X. So <clears throat> it's a big commitment on the part of the kids and their parents. Uh, but man, was it a fun study to run. Uh, we do our FDs and kids family style, so they're not stuck away in a room all by themselves during the daytime, the gray zones here, which was in dim light. The kids were doing some testing. Those are the white lines, including MSLTs, <clears throat> and then, you know, coming together with one another in our playroom which is also under dim light conditions. So here's what we found on our MSLTs. As some of you know, when you do forced desynchrony, you can really tease apart pretty effectively the, um, the effects of the clock and the effects of the homeostat. And so that's what I'm showing here. These are the multiple sleep latency test uh, values based on circadian phase. So irrespective of how long the child had been awake, these would be the values. And painted in the background here, this is a double plot. This would be the melatonin uh, values. Okay, so you can see a very lovely circadian pattern and this part being well known as clock dependent alerting phase of our circadian timing. And then here are the results for the MSLT, just how long the child had been awake, irrespective of circadian phase. So again, this is uh, an illustration of the homeostatic pressure, which mounts as you, the longer you stay awake. So we saw this, we knew what was going on with the two process model. We knew what was going on with the phase based on the data I just showed you. What are we seeing when we put these together? So well, what we see, so here again, those same plots, now here plotting the circadian uh, piece of sleep pressure and the homeostatic and the, <clears throat> and the phase angle between so the circuit, the clock and the wake up time. And you can see the little kids with the wide phase angle are waking up closer to the clock dependent alerting. And so they don't have a trough by the time it's bedtime, there's no trough because they're supported by clock dependent alerting. Uh, in contrast, our owls, the post-pubertal adolescents, are a narrower phase angle, and they're not supported by the clock-dependent alerting 
until later. And so we see them alert at the end of the night, sleepy in the middle of the day, and then alert again late in the day. So the trough is really uh, coming from a different mapping of the circadian timing system to the homeostatic system. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about circadian physiology in adolescence. So I'm only gonna look at three things, phase, period, and amplitude. So here are some data just showing, again, as a function of pubertal stage, the time of melatonin offset measured in conditions of um, constant routine. So you can see this phase is later as kids are more mature. And we can see similarly melatonin onset time. These are all kids who are on the same sleep-wake schedule. Um, not, this is not in constant conditions, but again, you can see that the more mature the child, the later the melatonin onset phase. So, you know, for us, this is a clear depiction. It's not just kids' phase preference, as we saw with the morningness, eveningness questionnaire, it's really associated with the melatonin uh, signal for the underlying biology. So we also measured circadian periods. So we're back to the same study uh, of forced desynchrony the, in that early group. And these are just showing, uh, this was our proof of concept. This is one child, this is melatonin onset phase. We're measuring from saliva, so we can only capture it when the child's awake. This is uh, the temperature trough, core body temperature trough, which we measured during the constant routines. And this is cortisol peak flowing here. So we were pretty confident in our measurement of period, which we subsequently measure solely with the melatonin onset. And this was just our earliest study where we put our adolescent uh, period lengths on a plot against the Harvard groups. Um, adults run in a sim very similar protocol, only I think with less sleep than we give the kids. So we subsequently have uh, done an evaluation using a four hour force desynchrony. And what we found was that, you know, here's age against circadian period. In the early, pre and early pubertal kids, there was a tendency to delay period as well, or to lengthen period as well as in, but not as notable in the Tanner three fives. And then in the, um, in the older cohort in this study, uh, or actually this was Dr. Crowley's group of adults. Uh, and you can see uh, maybe a tendency for a decline in the period. Manuel, should I take questions now or keep going, Manuel? Um, so we have a couple of questions that have come in, and maybe it's a good opportunity to, to ask these now. So I'll, uh, let me share my video quickly. Um, so the first question comes, comes from Sophia Axelrod, um, who wanted to know what the distribution of sleep parameters is in the kids at any point in time. Um, does sleep change, how does sleep change on an individual basis? Um, so are there kids that don't show changes while others do? Uh, and the same question for circadian rhythm development. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question and and that would be best answered in epidemiological studies where you have a lot of children. But one, one of the places on the circadian side, Till Rohnberg has his measure of um, phase, uh, which is the mid sleep on free nights. And one of his early papers which had the subtitle of a biological marker for the end of adolescence, you can see across the second decade that marker, that measure getting later and later and later. And in that study, you can see, you know, the plots, there are, is always a distribution, but on average, it gets later. Now, some, not everyone 
is going to display that. And some kids who are on the, you know, left end of the, of the, um, of the curve may keep position. And so not phase delay quite as much as the kids in the middle or the right end. Uh, in terms of the sleep patterns, we do see sleep patterns. I mean, easily they're delaying in, in the majority of children as well as they go through adolescence. So it's not, I not, can't say it's universal, but it certainly is prominent. Okay, and another question also from Sophia Axelrod. Um, do you see seasonal differences and or differences related to latitude or daily light exposure? Great question. And we did a little bit. Of, so in that survey study, we had a fair amount of uh, change in latitude as well as in longitude. And I don't think we did the best analysis of that, that we did see some differences with latitude. And again, there are others who've looked at certainly the circadian markers and sleep uh, as a function of longitude and where you are in your time zone. Uh, and so, you know, time zones breaks here. If you're here versus here, although you may only be, you know, very short distance apart because you're at a break in the time zone, it really can affect and impact well-being and, you know, the schedules for sleeping. Again, I would look, I would direct you to uh, Professor Rowenberg's work uh, and that will lead you forward. Mm -hmm. And we got one question from Julia Hartman. She wanted to know whether the laboratory studies were done with a static light um, or if you had any dynamic changes in light. They, the lights were off black, dark during sleep times and dim. At that point, we were dim at 20 lux measured at the eye level. Great. And then we just have one question in from Thomas Upton. Um, he's, he wants to know, I might have missed it, but in your slide, the linear fit of tennis stage versus melatonin onset and offset didn't look that strong. And he wants to know whether he's misinterpreted that. No, I mean, it's, it's statistically significant and there are individual differences. And the challenge with the both of those, although we're measuring it in a, um, the one in constant routine, the other, you know, what we don't have a good handle on was their light exposure before they came into the lab. And so we know that light exp prior light exposure can impact these things. So it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. Great question though. Good, I think I don't see any other questions coming in. Okay. Do you Shall wanna continue? Go ahead? Yeah, and then for, okay. for, for other questions, please put them in the Q&A um, and then we can return to Q&A after Mary has finished. Okay. Great. Okay, so I said we'd talk about amplitude. So these are data from that Dr. Crowley put together from our work. Um, basically, this is salivary melatonin levels measured during constant routine. And I think it's, it doesn't take rocket scientists to tell that the pre and early pubertal kids have a higher amplitude of their melatonin secretion than the more mature kids. So that's the circadian story. What about the sleep-wake homeostasis? Well, I'll share a few um, images for you of what we've seen as we've been looking at our kids. So here again, this is a child who was Tanner stage one, 12 years, 12 plus years old. This is the same child about two years later when she was now mature uh, in terms of her pubertal stage. And I, you know, I could you could just look at this and see, holy mackerel, uh, the sleep phenomenology changes enormously over time. And most um, 
easily seen in the slow wave sleep, which I've circled here. So tons and tons when she was 12 and Tanner one, uh, pounds and pounds when she was Tanner five. So far less slow wave sleep. And also, uh, and this, you know, Oscar Yaney was a postdoc with us at the time. And you can see that the slow wave activity on this scale is, is equally diminished over that two year period. And we see this, you know, when we look at more kids in these analyses. So, but that's phenomenology to my mind and probably related to cortical synaptic density uh, or cortical thickness and less so to the homeostatic process. So uh, with Oski, Oscar Yaney and Peter Ackerman, um, they did the modeling to look at the more the homeostatic phenomena of, uh, a, of slow wave activity. Uh, and so they modeled using data we had collected from kids before and after a full night of sleep deprivation. And what they found was that the decay time constant, which is a good marker of the recovery, really showed no change in our pre and early pubertal participants and our post pubertal participants. But when they modeled the same data for the rise time constant, so how fast the homeostatic drive uh, grows over time, you can see that there is a difference from the pre and early pubertal to post pubertal kids. So about nine hours, to about 12 hours. So I interpret that as the process S building at a slower rate with each hour awake in the more mature kids than in the less mature kids. We had another way of looking at this change in sleep propensity, which is a little less sophisticated, but brings us back to the multiple sleep latency test. And here we're comparing pre-pubertal kids and post-pubertal kids over a day through the next night. So they were awake in between the sleep latency tests. And so here we're looking at how long they've been awake. And you can see not a lot of difference uh, between the groups until we get out to having been awake for 14 or 16 hours where you see the less mature kids showing much faster sleep onset than the more mature kids. And by the time you get out to 18 hours, everybody is really you know, pretty much a basket case. Can I say that? Um, we, Dr. DeMent used to call this range shorter than five minutes as the twilight zone. So everyone's in the twilight zone out here during the night. So, you know, the, the bottom line here is that there's a change in these uh, two processes, circadian rhythms and homeostatic across adolescent development in many children. So I'm not gonna say every child, but these, uh, schematics kind of illustrate that. So you see here the phase delays in the older adolescents and sleep pressure. So phase is later and the sleep pressure builds more slowly in the older adolescents. So both of those uh, tendencies favor a delay in the timing of sleep across adolescents. Oh, okay. So my, you know, little brain said there's lots going on there that makes it look like adolescents need less sleep, but maybe they don't really. And if we put all these things together, which I did try to do here, it tells the story, at least for me. So here's our pre adolescence and here's adolescent development. So our pre-adolescents are sleeping well, you know, they go to bed at bedtime, they get up, as Dr. Dement would say, with a smile and 
on their lips and a song in their hearts. But then adolescent development comes along with these biological changes that favor a delay in the timing of sleep. And a lot of the psychosocial pressures that are coming on board during adolescent development. So they want to set their own bedtime. They've got a lot of schoolwork. Oh yeah, they, they now have screen time, social networking, very, very important. But then we have uh, the grown-ups come into the picture, pushing for an early rise time. So blocking this extended sleep, which was plenty of sleep under these circumstances. But we say, no, to play your sport, you have to get up early because, I don't know, the, the ice time isn't available later in the day. Or in the US, the older adolescents, have to start school earlier, which is a big sort of uh, issue nowadays that's being addressed. But we end up in our older adolescents going to bed late, getting up too early, giving them long days, short sleep, and uh, in many of them, a very profound weekend sleep delay or social jet lag. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Crowley reworked this a little bit differently, but we've got the same things going on. Short and ill-timed sleep in our older adolescents resulting from biology and society and psychosocial um, activities. So this is another way to look at it, put in a broader context uh, which with Dr. Tarok and Salatin uh, and I put together in this uh, paper we did more recently. So we can think of things we can modify. So school start times, the curricular and extracurricular activities, access to technology, um, and then things that are going on that we could do a little bit, these uh, intrinsic things, we could help to set the clock earlier, uh, but that's pretty much on an individual basis. The other parts of this context, not just sleep physiology or circadian physiology, but the brain is also maturing and, uh, and the, what we see in their sleep is changing and what we see in their brain structure is changing. And all these things, I apologize for this slide, lead to outcomes that are challenging uh, for learning and memory, for risk-taking and injury, reward, um, and basically their functioning in school. So we see then other factors not up here, sleep disorder. Some kids have sleep disorders. Some have mental health challenges or behavioral health challenges. And we can't forget the social disparities that are impacting pretty much this entire uh, context. So there's a lot going on. <clears throat> and, you know, for me, a big part of the heart of it is the change in the biology that's regulating the timing of sleep. So that was it. Um, 